Charlotte's Web, chapter six, is called Summer Days. The early summer days on a farm are the happiest and fairest days of the year. Lilacs bloom and make the air sweet and then fade. As apple blossoms come with the lilacs and the bees visit around among the apple trees. The days grow warm and soft. School ends and children have time to play and fish for trouts in the brook. Avery often brought a trout home in his pocket, warm and stiff and ready to be fried for supper. Now that school was over, Fern visited the barn almost every day to sit quietly on her stool. The animals treated her as an equal. The sheep lay calmly at her feet. Around the 1st of July, the workhorses were hitched to the mowing machine and Mr. Zuckerman climbed into the seat and drove into the field. All morning, you could hear the rattle of the machines as it went round and round while the tall grass fell down behind the cutter bar. Next day, if there was no thunder shower, all hands would help rake and pitch and load and the hay would be hauled to the barn in a high hay wagon with Fern and Avery riding at the top of the load. Then the hay would be hoisted, sweet and warm, into the big loft until the whole barn seemed like a wonderful bed of timothy and clover. It was fine to jump in and perfect to hide in. And sometimes Avery would find a little grass snake in the hay and he would add it to the other things in his pocket. Early summer days are a jubilee time for birds. In the fields, around the house, in the barn, in the woods, in the swamp, everywhere, love and songs and nests and eggs. From the edge of the woods, the white-throated sparrow, which must come all the way from Boston, called, oh, Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. On the apple bough, the Phoebe teeters and wags its tail and says, Phoebe, Phoebe. The song sparrow, who knows how briefly and lovely life is, says, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude, sweet, sweet, sweet interlude. If you enter the barn, the swallows swoop down from their nest and scold, cheeky, cheeky, they say. In early summer, there are plenty of things for a child to eat and drink and suck and chew. Dandelion stems are full of milk. Clover heads are loaded with nectar. The frigid air is full of ice cold drinks. Everywhere you look is life. Even the little ball of spit on the walk steed, if you poke it apart, has a green worm inside. And on the underside of the leaf of the potato vine are bright orange eggs of the potato bug. It was on a day in early summer that the goose eggs hatched. This was an important event in the barn cellar. Fern was there sitting on her stool when it happened. Except for the goose herself, Charlotte was the first to know that the goslings had last arrived. The goose knew a day in advance that they were coming. She could hear their weak voices calling from inside the egg. She knew they were in a desperately cramped position inside the shell and were most anxious to break through and get out. So she sat still and talked less than usual. When the first gosling poked its green gray head through the goose feathers and looked around, Charlotte spied it and made an announcement. Made the announcement. I am sure, she said, that every one of us here will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of our friend, the goose, she now has something to show for it. The goslings have arrived. May I offer my sincere congratulations. Thank you, thank you, thank you, said the goose, nodding and bowing shamelessly. Thank you, said the gander. Congratulations, said Wilbur. How many goslings are there? I can only see one. There are seven, said the goose. Fine, said Charlotte. Seven is a lucky number. Luck had nothing to do with this, said the goose. It was good management and hard work. At this point, Templeton showed his nose from his hiding place under Wilbur's trough. He glanced at Fern, then crept cautiously toward the goose, keeping close to the wall. Everyone watched him, for he was not well liked, not trusted. Look, he began in a sharp voice, you say you have seven goslings. There were eight eggs. What happened to the other egg? Why didn't it hatch? It's a dud, I guess, said the goose. What are you going to do with it? asked Templeton, his round beady eyes fixed on the goose. 
You can have it, replied the goose. Roll it away and add it to that nasty collection of yours. Templeton had a habit of picking up unusual objects around the farm and storing them in his home. He saved everything. Certainly, 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 said the gander. You may have the egg, but I'll tell you one thing, Templeton. If I ever catch you poking, oking, oking your ugly nose around our goslings, I'll give you the worst pounding a rat ever took. And the gander opened his strong winds and beat, wings and beat the air with them to show his power. He was strong and brave, but the truth is, both Goose and Gander were worried about Templeton, and with good reason. The rat had no morals, no conscience, no scruples, no consideration, no decency, no milk of rodent kindness, no compunctions, no higher feelings, no friendliness, no anything. He would kill a gosling if he could get away with it. The Goose knew that. Everybody knew that. With her broad bill, the goose pushed the unhatched egg out of her nest, and the entire company watched in disgust while the rat rolled it away. Even Wilbur, who could eat almost anything, was appalled. Imagine wanting a chunky old rotten egg, he muttered. A rat is a rat, said Charlotte. She laughed a tinkling laugh. <laughs> but friends, my friends, if that ancient egg ever breaks, this barn will be untenable. What does that mean? asked Wilbur. It means nobody will be able to live here on account of the smell. A rotten egg is a regular stink bomb. It won't break, snarled Templeton. I know what I'm doing. I handle stuff like this all the time. He disappeared into his tunnel, pushing the goose egg in front of him. He pushed and nudged till succeeded in rolling it into his lair under the trough. That afternoon, when the wind had died down and the barnyard was quiet and warm, the gray goose led her seven goslings out of the nest and out into the world. Mr. Zuckerman spied them when he came with Wilbur's supper. Well, hello there, he said, smiling all over. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven baby geese. Now, isn't that lovely? Okay, and here's a picture of um, Templeton getting the, um, the dud egg and everyone's looking at him. You can see Wilbur peeking through. And then you can see I circled this vocabulary word. It means having no like regret or not being ashamed. And the rat isn't ashamed, but the rat is a rat. He's just going by his instincts. Okay, chapter seven, bad news. Wilbur liked Charlotte better and better each day. Her campaign against insects seemed sensible and useful. Hardly anybody around the farm had a good word to say for a fly. Flies spent their time pestering others. The cows hated them. The horse dis detested them. The sheep loathed them. Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman were always complaining about them and putting up screens. Wilbur admired the way Charlotte managed. He was particularly glad that she could always put her victim to sleep before eating it. It's real thoughtful of you to do that, Charlotte, he said. Yes, she replied in her sweet musical voice. I always give them an anesthetic so they won't feel pain. It's a little service I throw in. As days went by, Wilbur grew and grew. He ate three big meals a day. He spent long hours lying on his side, half asleep, dreaming pleasant dreams. He enjoyed good health and gained a lot of weight. One afternoon, when Fern was sitting on her stool, the oldest sheep walked into the barn and stopped to pay a call on Wilbur. Hello, seems to me you're putting on weight, she said. Yes, I guess I am, Wilbur replied. At my age, it's a good idea to keep gaining. Just the same, I don't envy you, said the old sheep. You know why they're fattening you up, don't you? No, said Wilbur. Well, I don't like to spread bad news, said the sheep but they're fattening you up because they're going to kill you, that's why. They're going to what? Screamed Wilbur. Fern grew rigid on her stool. Kill you, turn you into smoked bacon and ham, continued the old sheep. Almost all young pigs get murdered by the farmer as soon as the real cold weather sets in. There's a regular conspiracy around here to kill you at Christmas time. Everybody is in on the plot. Lurby, Zuckerman, even John Arabelle. Mr. Arabelle? Ooh, 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 sobbed Wilbur. Fern's father? Certainly. 
When a pig is to be butchered, everybody helps. I'm an old sheep and I see the same thing, same old business, year after year. Arabelle arrives with his 22, shoots the... Stop, screamed Wilbur. I don't want to die. Save me, somebody, save me. Fern was just about to jump up when a voice was heard. Be quiet, Wilbur, said Charlotte, who had been listening to this awful conversation. I can't be quiet, screamed Wilbur, racing up and down. I don't want to be killed. I don't want to die. Is it true what the old sheep says, Charlotte? Is it true they're going to kill me when the cold weather comes? Well, said the spider, plucking thoughtfully at her web, the old sheep has been around this barn a long time. She has seen many a spring pig come and go. If she says they plan to kill you, I'm sure it's true. It's also the dirtiest trick I've ever heard of. What people don't think of. Wilbur burst into tears. I don't want to die, he moaned. I want to stay alive right here in my comfortable manure pile with all my friends. I want to breathe the beautiful air and lie in the beautiful sun. You're certainly making a beautiful noise, snapped the old sheep. I don't want to die, screamed Wilbur, throwing himself on the ground. You shall not die, Charlotte said briskly. What? Really? cried Wilbur. Who's going to save me? I am, said Charlotte. How? asked Wilbur. That remains to be seen, but I am going to save you, and I want you to quiet down immediately. You are carrying on in a childish way. Stop your crying. I can't stand hysterics. Wow. Oh boy, that was a big chapter. And now we're at to chapter eight, which is called A Talk at Home. On Sunday morning, Mr. and Mrs. Arabelle and Fern were sitting at the breakfast table in the kitchen. Avery had finished and was upstairs looking for his slingshot. Do you know that Uncle Homer's goslings hatched? Asked Fern. How many? Asked Mr. Arabelle. Seven, replied Fern. There were eight eggs, but one didn't hatch. And the goose told Templeton she didn't want it anymore, so he took it away. The goose did what? asked Mrs. Arabel, gazing at her daughter with a queer, worried look. Told Templeton she didn't want the egg anymore, reported Vern. Who's Templeton? asked Mrs. Arabel. He's the rat, replied Fern. None of us like him much. Who's us? asked Mr. Arabel. Oh, everybody in the barn cellar. Wilbur and the sheep and the lambs and the goose and the gander and the goslings and Charlotte and me. Charlotte? asked Mrs. Arabel. Who's Charlotte? She's Wilbur's best friend. She's terribly clever. What does she look like? Asked Mrs. Arabel. Well, said Fern thoughtfully, she has eight legs. All spiders do, I guess. Charlotte is a spider? Asked Fern's mother. Fern nodded. A big gray one. She has a web across the top of Wilbur's doorway. She catches flies and sucks their blood. Wilbur adores her. Does he really? Asked Mrs. Arabel rather vaguely. She was staring at Fern now with a worried expression on her face. Oh yes, Wilbur adores Charlotte, said Fern. Do you know what Charlotte said when the gosling hatched? Goslings hatched? I haven't the faintest idea, Mr. Arable said. Tell us. Well, when the first gosling stuck out his little head from under the goose, I was sitting on my stool in the corner and Charlotte was on her web. She made a speech. She said, I am sure that every one of us here in the barn cellar will be gratified to learn that after four weeks of unremitting effort and patience on the part of the goose, she now has something to show for it. Don't you think that was a pleasant thing for her to say? Yes, I do, said Mrs. Arabelle. And now, Fern, it's time to get ready for Sunday school and tell Avery to get ready. And this afternoon, you can tell me more about what goes on in Uncle Homer's barn. Aren't you spending quite a lot of time there? You go there almost every afternoon, don't you? I like it there, Fern replied. She wiped her mouth and ran upstairs. After she left the room, Mrs. Arabel spoke in a low voice to her husband. I worry about Fern, she said. Did you hear the way she rambled on about the animals, pretending that they talked? Mr. Arabel chuckled. Maybe they do talk, he said. I've sometimes wondered. At any rate, don't worry about Fern. She's just got a lively imagination. Kids think they hear all sorts of things. Just the same, I do worry about her, replied Mrs. Arabelle. I think I shall ask Dr. Dorian about her the next time I see him. 
He loves Fern almost as much as we do, and I want him to know how queerly she's acting about that pig and everything. I don't think it's normal. You know perfectly well animals don't talk. Mr. Arabelle grinned. Maybe our ears aren't as sharp as Fern's, he said.